as we speak japan's prime minister shinzo abe is in the last leg of his two day india visit really he's about to wrap up the visit very soon later tonight uh, i have with me our editor pranab dal samanta to give us a perspective into what happened in these two days and what it means for india and japan's relations pranab to begin with what are the big takeaways i know with your eye for detail you must have gone through that joint statement very very closely so can you tell us what are the big takeaways uh, no ruy really, uh, thanks a lot for having me over uh, the clearly it's just the it's just how exhaustive this document is in itself tells you the the range uh, of cooperation between india and japan today there is uh, hardly any area which has been left out right and that is important to take note of uh, from and and the big addition is in defense we all know japan has a history of you know uh, after the second world war so mr shinzo abe has kind of mugon ahead and uh, made this amendment in the japanese constitution that allows him to pursue a more robust defense industry in japan right now that has taken shape and evolved uh, during his prime ministership and just before he goes into elections now this has taken shape in uh, properly in this joint statement as a concrete area of cooperation and right. you see uh, technical discussions beginning on unmanned Uh, ground vehicles and robotics and such kind of high tech areas in defense which is a big plus right apart from that japanese assistance continues in india's northeast which shows the level of trust which india has with japan right and of course across areas from nuclear to space to all priority areas of the prime minister narendra modi clean clean india initiative or ganga everywhere japan is mentioned it's it just shows that this is perhaps the most important or the deepest relationship which india has uh, with any global power at this point yes. right you know we've seen you mentioned uh, defense of course we've seen that japan has traditionally been not very comfortable talking about defense cooperation is that changing now and why is it changing now well i think this is part of growing aspirations of japan but more importantly the security environment in the asia pacific has been changing and we've been taking note about that uh, the rise of china has not been very peaceful it has in fact led to other countries feeling more insecure and japan is no exception uh, ever since there has been this debate in japan that would just being in the us uh, protection umbrella so to say right. suffice its the security needs given the way the us has begun to look at itself and wants to retract Uh, more and more from these responsibilities japan has taken a conscious decision and this has been an evolving decision right to a uh, kind of revive its defense industry it already has a good base it has a high tech industry base so that has allowed it to make the transition and we now see that they want to um, you know make partnerships with the uh, friends like india right right well both uh, japan and india of course want to keep china in check as you mentioned they are they are worried about china's rising dominance and power how much does that influence the equation between japan and india well you know it's it's unsaid but it is said all over and can you give us examples uh, no i mean it's, it's it's there whether you talk about asia pacific you, you talk about unclos you talk about north korea it's all there given the fact that the, japan is helping india in the northeast which borders china right but china is not mentioned right <laughs> so uh, so that's that shows how 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 civilizational powers kind of uh, deal with such issues uh, uh, it's not an, a, a partnership against china i think that would be unfair but it is definitely two countries pooling their resources and making their global presence felt uh and they are working in third countries you know there is talk about working in africa i'm sure in future they'll be working in afghanistan they'll be working in third countries to kind of join their partnership to counter the the chinese uh, kind of uh, expansion which is there in africa or any other part of the world right well the high point of course has been the bullet train because we know it has a connect with people so everybody is sort of excited about it and talking about it do you think it's over ambitious No not at all I mean uh, frankly when it started with the metro a lot of people used to mention that right but I don't know why this diffidence in India because uh, most of India is aspirational they want to go in better cars I mean let's go back in time let's go back to Maruti Suzuki right that was the first partnership with Japan all of these are great symbols in India Japan relationship so you have the Maruti symbol then you have the metro symbol and now you have the Shinkansen 
and uh, why not? I mean, uh, uh, if, if Japan has helped us making these leaps historically, so I don't see, first of all, something which is completely new. If it was over ambitious, it's as over ambitious as the metro was, and, right. and it's and it's today working really well in Delhi. Every state capital wants one. Right. So I I, I think this is a, a poverty of thought by anyone who's trying to propound that. Right. Well, can you tell us something about uh, Abe and PM Modi's personal equation? We do know they share a good personal rapport. Can you can you explain how that is affecting this dynamic? They're very similar leaders. Um, uh, 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 Prime Minister Abe has kind of uh, built his politics around a revival, uh, revivalistic Japanese nationalism. Right. We know how important nationalism is to Mr. Modi's politics, so they both respect each other. They have a strong sense of cultural nationalism, which is also very common in that respect. Uh, they think also very similarly. You know. Uh, uh, it's uh, it was actually Prime Minister when, uh, Modi when he was Chief Minister. Right. When he visited Japan, uh, it's then when he actually boarded the Shinkansen, and it was then that the idea was planted. Right. All right. So uh, so this has been going on the mutual admiration which Japan has with Gujarat. Right. So this has been going on ever since. So I, I think it's a. It's it's a partnership which is you know of personal chemistry of two very similar leaders. Right. Well, he's uh, of course taken personal interest in this, hosting him in Gujarat. He's. Uh, what does that really tell you about the politics internally as well? One thing which tells you is that uh, Mr. Modi has been trying to move things out of Delhi, and which I think is good. Right. Right. It showcases other parts. So the last time it was the Ganga Arti in Varanasi. Now he's taken him to Gujarat. He took President Xi Jinping Xi, to right, Gujarat. Right. Uh, there, that time it was Sabarmati. Now it's a different theme. Uh, I think it also shows uh, confidence of a leader, and he wants uh, the, the, of Prime Minister Modi, who's won an election uh, on his own steam, and uh, that's what popular politicians often do. They go and showcase other parts of their country. And uh, Gujarat is basically his home turf, so it's good. He's taking he's taking diplomacy out, out of Delhi. Of Delhi. Yes. Let me draw you a little into uh, domestic politics and quote what the Congress yesterday said. This was Congress spokesperson Manish Tiwari who said Gujarat goes to the polls soon. Could it be that the country's diplomatic machinery is being misused for political ends? Uh, it's 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 it's. I mean, the Congress can't play politics with. And they are competitors, prime competitors in uh, for the BJP in Gujarat. Right. Uh, but frankly, uh, these kind of diplomatic forays should be looked differently. I mean, uh, does Mr. Abe going there lead to vote uh, garnering for the BJP? I think Mr. Modi can can do that himself. Uh, what it also, but what it does in terms of profile for Gujarat is good, right. and uh, that kind of profile was good even for UP when he went to Varanasi and that kind of profile uh, should be um, I mean, encouraged in right. that sense. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, just to wrap up quickly, we know uh, Prime Minister Abe's own popularity has been dipping. It's perhaps at, a, at an all-time low for him. Does that impact his equations with other heads of state? Uh, I think everybody is waiting for the elections. Japan has had a rocky uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a robust uh, political uh, system and uh, there are parties which constantly wife of Mr. Abe has seen his ups and downs. That's domestic politics. Uh, I don't think the India-Japan relationship is centered around a leader. Right. All right. So uh, there will be continuity regardless of Mr. Abe. You might say some, uh, somewhere the pace might quicken, sometimes it might be uh, slow depending on which government is in power. Mr. Abe is, for instance, a great votary of, you know, very few people know that the term Indo-Pacific. Right. We keep using Asia-Pacific as a matter of habit. And this whole joint statement uses the term Indo-Pacific. This coinage was made by Shinzo Abe himself. Right. He was the first one to bring in India and Pacific. So he is the first one to actually use this lexicon. Uh, so. Uh, so that I think is 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 uh, is the personal touch. Right. Uh, if he's not there, but systems and you know Japan is a is is a, is, 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 is a very robust system in that sense. So I think the interaction will continue. 
Right. Well, that was Pranav. He walked us through this two-day visit by Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Uh, taking diplomacy out of Delhi and to other states is one key point that he made. And of course, that the China happens to be not the dragon, but the elephant in the room. It looms all over, but was not mentioned in the joint statement or anywhere. Thanks so much for watching.